This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. From the time we are born, trust becomes a life-sustaining characteristic we all depend upon. For many of us, our parents are among the first opportunities we have to begin building trust in our lives. As we progress through life, circumstances provide us with additional chances to build trust along the way. A friend, a coach, a pastor or a supervisor at work, and eventually a mate that becomes our life partner. All of them provide us suitable circumstances to experience trust. But what happens when conflict arises among those we trust? How does trust benefit us then? What is the advantage trust provides when facing conflict with those whom we trust? Well, stay with us as we begin to explore the dichotomy of trust and conflict on today's program. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Mike James. Hi, welcome to another edition of the Armor of God. We're glad you could join us for today's program. What we're going to look at today are some tenets of Christian leadership. We're only going to look at two tenets, and the two that I'm going to address today are trust and conflict. Now, when I say trust and conflict, you're probably thinking to yourself, wait a minute, how are those related to leadership? I'm going to get to that. Hang, hang in there with me, and we're going to address that. But when you think of leadership as a Christian, why should we be thinking of leadership? Well, turn with me over in your Bibles, if you have them handy, to Revelation 5 and verse 10. And here's what it says there, Revelation 5, 10. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, 2,000 years ago, kings and priests were leaders. They led the people in various ways. In God's future kingdom, if you are a believer in God, if you're following God, if you've been baptized and have repented, you're going to be in that kingdom and you are going to be a leader in God's kingdom. I think we should try to be leaders now, whether it's in our church, our family, at our place of employment, at school, and we can be leaders now, and this will help get us ready for that coming kingdom. Now, when we look at the word trust, and conflict, let's look at some definitions of these terms. When I say trust, you'll find in dictionaries things like this, belief in and reliance on the integrity, strength, ability, surety of a person or thing. Trust can also be confident expectation of something. Trust is hope. Now, what's the definition of conflict? Conflict is to come into collision or disagreement. Conflict can also be to be at variance or in opposition. And finally, conflict is to contend or to do battle. Now, when you think of trust and conflict, they seem to be opposing ideas. But let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, unless you have trust, you can't really discuss and debate and talk about problems and issues that you have. You're going to be afraid to do that. You're going to be cautious about doing it. You are going to sweep it under the rug rather than to step into that conflict because of the fears you have of how it might go. But if you have trust, you can step into that. You can overcome those problems and those issues that you may have. So that's how conflict and trust work together when we think about being a leader and leadership tenets. 
I'm going to get some assistance today from a book that I read. The title of the book was The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's written by Patrick Lencioni. Lencioni is a business consultant and what he does is he goes into business places and he deals with team issues and he helps these teams resolve their issues and start working in a better way. Now that takes leadership and that's going to fit right into what we're talking about on today's program. But before we do anything further, we want to offer you some free CDs on today's program. Both of these CDs will address various aspects of leadership. The first CD we'd like to offer you today is titled, Conflict is Good. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, conflict can be good because it resolves issues. It overcomes problems. It helps you grow as a person and as a Christian. Get Conflict is Good by Mike James. We also want to offer you the CD, Overcoming Team Dysfunction. This particular CD will look at trust, it will look at commitment, it will look at accountability, it will look at focusing on results, and it will address conflict and how all of these items play into being a strong leader. To get both of these CDs free of charge, all you need to do is call toll-free 1-888-578 8791. That's 1 888 578 8791. You can also order by going to our website www.cgi.org. That's www.cgi.org. You can also go to our website to learn more about our weekly sermon broadcast. Go to www.cgi.org. Welcome back, those of you who joined us at the top of today's program, and those of you who are just joining us, we're talking about a couple tenets of leadership, specifically trust, and how trust plays into conflict. We're going to get some assistance today from a book I read titled, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and it was written by a fellow named Patrick Lencioni. Now when you look at the idea of trust and conflict, they play into each other from this perspective. If you've got trust, if you've developed a relationship long enough and hard enough, and you've got trust established with someone, it's much easier to address the hard issues with that person than if you did not develop the bonds of trust with that person. Think about who you get into Hot, hot discussions with, rough discussions with. It's usually a family member or someone you know pretty good. You usually don't do this with strangers and that's because you haven't developed that bond of trust, that relationship that then allows you to deal with the difficult issues you need to deal with. Now, in Patrick Lencioni's book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, he looks at this idea of trust from this perspective. He says, you know that you have trust with someone if you can say things like this to that person. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. You're better at that than I am. I'm not sure how to do this. I need help. I'm wrong. When you can open up and be transparent and reveal those types of things to somebody else, you probably have a good relationship with that person. But think about coming into a job for the first time. Are you going to tell your boss immediately, I need help, or I'm having a problem with this or that? Many of us fear doing that type of thing because we haven't developed that strong relationship yet. We aren't sure how those people are going to look at us, how those people are going to see us. And that's all about trust, ladies and gentlemen. It takes time to develop trust, but we need it. We need it to be strong leaders. Now looking at trust, I want to see, does the Bible address trust in some way? 
When we look at Jesus and his team of disciples, did Jesus show that he needed to have trust with them? He needed to have a good, strong relationship with them in order to get them to do what was needing to be done. Let's take a look at some scriptures and see if there's some evidence for that. The first scripture I'd like to take a look at is over in the book of Mark. And this deals with the vulnerability aspect of relationship and trust. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 34, Jesus is on the cross. He's about to die. And listen to what he says here, Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbathani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is pouring out his emotion here to the Father in heaven. And he's saying, why hast thou forsaken me? Now think about that. He's really being transparent here. In his humanness, he's revealing the pain that he's feeling here. Now, what's interesting about this is the reason Jesus can do that is because his bond with the Father is like this. They are one, folks. They are one. They have a trusting, complete relationship. And Jesus is able to express himself in this way with the Father. And the Father would completely understand where Jesus was coming from in expressing that. Now, interestingly enough, this same phraseology is used in Psalm chapter 22 and verse 1. And I think it's important that we look at that because I want to make a point about this. Psalm 22 and verse 1, notice what it says here. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's exactly what Jesus said. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Now, who said this? David, King David said this. Now, why is it interesting that King David said this? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're probably familiar with the idea that David was a king and Jesus was in the line of David. Now, what's even more interesting is the fact that David is called a man after God's own heart. Why was David a man after God's own heart? I'm going to submit to you today that I believe it's because David was transparent with God. David was open and honest with God. David was revealing with God. David had a rock-solid relationship with God, built from the time he was a small child. Because what happened with David and Goliath? David wasn't a, an adult male at that particular time. He was a young man. And he took on this giant and he had no reservations of taking on that giant because of his relationship with God. There was a trust there. There was a faith there. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. That's what God wants from us as leaders for God, as leaders in our family, as leaders in our church. We've got to have a complete trust and faith in God. And once we've got that, we can then build out from that particular foundation. Now, let's look a little bit further at trust in the Bible. We see that God wants that trusting relationship with us. David had it with the Father. Jesus Christ had it with the Father. Hopefully, we all have it with God. But notice something further about trust, building trust. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 14, there's another important thing we need to remember about building a trusting relationship, which then allows you to have the conflicts to get through the problems that allow you to then get into what you really want to do and what your goals are. In Mark 3 and verse 14, it says this, And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. Now, now what am I getting at here? He ordained twelve that they should be with him. So they got to relate with him, spend time with him first. Then they would go out to preach. Why did Jesus spend, some say, three, three and a half years with his disciples? Why does he spend that length of time? He's Jesus. Couldn't he have done it in a month? 
Couldn't he have done it in six months? Why did it take three years of continually going around Galilee and Judea with these guys? Because he's building a relationship with these guys over that time frame. He got to know these guys. He got to understand these guys and work with these guys. That trusting relationship was built. And then they were able to do what needed to be done when he left this earth. Notice something interesting here in the book of James. Another thing to keep in mind about trust. Remember what Lencioni says. He says, if you can say things like, I'm wrong, I messed up, I'm sorry. If you can open up like that with people, you've probably got a pretty trusting relationship. And notice what James chapter 5, verse 16 says. Is it similar to what I just said about Lencioni in his book? James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Why does God want us to confess our faults one to another? Now, I don't think he's saying here that you confess your faults to anybody out there or your deepest, darkest secrets to anyone out there. But within a trusting relationship, people you know well within the church or the elders within the church, when you can open up about things, there's a space that's created. There's a vulnerability there that people are going to be impacted by. You've created a space where that other person can now speak into it issues or problems that they also have. And then you're well on your way to building a solid relationship when you can be transparent and open as the Bible says and as many of these individuals out in the public arena today who talk about leadership and team building. Another example I want to relate from Lencioni's book had to do with a particular example he experienced when he went to do some consulting work at a particular place of business. What was happening at this place of business was one of the individuals in this particular team was looked at by the others on the team as holier than thou, as standoffish. They thought of this woman as being better than them, or at least they felt that she thought she was better than them. And what, what they did was they related this to Lencioni, and Lencioni was able to start to talk to the team and find out some of the issues that this particular team was experiencing. Now, what he found was he did a little exercise with this group of people, and he had them talk in different ways about their early childhood experiences and how life was for them as they were growing up. And what came from this discussion was the woman revealed that as a child, her father was a military officer, so they were being uprooted every two or three years and moving to a different location. And she said this caused her not to have very strong relationships with people, and she didn't get to know people very well. She didn't have any strong friendships. The other thing about this woman that was interesting was she was a great piano player. And as a child, she went to many recitals, many concerts, and she was thought of as being highly acclaimed by those who listened to her play. But what her father did at the end of every one of her performances is he told her what was wrong about her performance. He didn't build her up, he tore her down. And so when the people heard this from the woman, they realized that their judgment of this woman had been wrong, that there was a reason why she had issues in building relationships and talking to people. And this helped this team become a stronger team and work better together because they opened up about their own issues that they all were having because this woman had finally revealed what was going on with her. That's all about trust, folks. That's what relationship is. And it's hard work. It's not easy to do that. We've all had stuff happen to us in life. But when you can begin to talk about this stuff with other people, you begin to overcome all of that stuff that has had its grip on you in your life. 
Now, another aspect of leadership, another tenet of leadership is being able to have conflict, being able to have debate, being able to deal with problems and issues. Many times teams fall apart because the team cannot deal with the issue at hand. They sweep it under the rug. They pretend it doesn't exist. We've got to deal with stuff, folks. That's what leadership is about, dealing with problems and issues. But if you have not established trust, if you have not established a strong relationship, it's so much harder to deal with the problems that come up. Now do you see how trust flows right into dealing with conflict? Now let's talk a little bit about conflict right now. And I want to do that by addressing some scriptures in the Bible that will help us understand this a little bit better. Now, what I want to do is, is I want to first mention that whenever you do decide that you're going to have a debate, when you're going to deal with a contentious issue, it's a good idea to create boundaries around this debate or this conflict you're about to get into. In over 10 years of marriage now, me and my wife have created a few boundaries when we know we're going to get into a little debate or conflict. What we've learned is we need to tone down our voices a little bit. Both of us have a tendency to raise our voices a bit. We also allow the other person to completely complete what they are about to say. We let them finish completely. We ask them, are you done? And while they're speaking, we may be taking notes to let them know that we're listening. We may be looking them right in the eye so they know that we're listening. I had the tendency to look sideways at my wife when she was talking to me about something. But now we've created boundaries that help us deal with conflict a little bit better. Well, you need to do the same thing with whatever issues are at hand. But does the Bible say that conflict is good? Does the Bible say we need to have conflict? Let's see what Scripture has to say on this subject. I'd like you to turn with me, if you have your Bibles handy, to Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 22. Notice the relationship here between Jesus and one of his disciples. Do you think they had a very trusting relationship? This is Matthew 16 and verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Jesus is telling Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Now that's pretty harsh language, ladies and gentlemen. Most of us are not likely to talk to our friends like that or people that we respect. But here's what was going on. Peter was a little bit of a rabble rouser. He was probably an extroverted individual. Jesus knew how to deal with Peter because Jesus had been building a relationship with Peter. Jesus knew Peter could handle this language that Jesus was using with him. And that's another thing you need to understand as a leader. You need to understand people are different and we need to deal with people in different ways and with different methods. Now, another aspect of conflict that is revealed in the pages of your Bible is over in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Notice what Jesus says here in Matthew 10, verse 34. He says, Think not that I am come to bring, send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to live a Christian life, if you are going to let people know that you are a Christian, you're going to come into conflict with people. And you need to be true to who you are. 
Jesus didn't come to bring peace on this earth. He came to bring conflict because the gospel message will conflict with all the other messages that are on this earth. And as a true Christian, you've got to be pushing that Christian agenda as you move through your existence. Another scripture that's very profound when we think of conflict and leadership is over in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. Listen to what this says, Matthew 18 and verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Oh boy, folks, if we could just do that. If we could just do that. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've had people vent to me about some issue they have with somebody else. And I ask them, did you let that person know you're having this issue with them? And they're like dumbfounded by that. They don't want to talk to that person about that issue because they feel funny about it. They feel like there's going to be a problem if they deal with this issue and that person. But God is saying you've got to do that. You've got to do the hard work. If you're a leader, folks, it's not easy. You've got to get people to understand these concepts and then take them on and do them. It's important that we take this to the person that we're having the issue with rather than gossiping and venting it to other people who are then going to pass it on to other people. Can you see how important the Bible seems to say conflict is? And conflict doesn't have to be a nasty word, folks. You can have conflict and not be yelling at each other. You can have conflict and not be that upset if you put those boundaries around it and try to keep the emotion out of it. Now, as we start to wind down on today's program, I want to show you one more quick scripture here in Matthew chapter 20. The sons of Zebedee's mother had come to Jesus and she said to them, I want you to have this son on your right hand and this son on your left hand in the kingdom. And Jesus kind of told her he, she didn't know what she was asking. Now the other disciples heard about this and they had a problem with it. There was dissension in the ranks. Did Jesus sweep it under the rug? Did Jesus say, I'll get to this issue later? No, in Matthew 20 and 24, Jesus takes the bull by the horns and listen to this. And when the 10 heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, and then Jesus dealt with the issue immediately in leadership we've got to deal with things immediately right then and there ladies and gentlemen what I'd like to remind you folks is those two CDs we're offering on today's program please get the CD conflict is good and also get the CD overcoming team dysfunction they will help you understand leadership concepts that are important for Christians thanks for joining us today Please put on the whole armor of God so you can stand in the evil day. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas 75701 or call toll free at 1 888 578 8791 or call 1 903 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.